college should be a time of excitement, exploration, a time to redefine who you are. For some students, they may be the first in their family to attend college, trying to not only better their own lives, but the lives of their families too. Literally everybody in my family was unemployed. But for others, attending college may be an even bigger deal and an even bigger challenge. I had enough money to stay in hotels for the beginning of my homelessness. After the money ran out, I then went to the result to the shelter because I knew that I wanted to keep my kids safe. Thanks to brave students sharing their stories and the dedicated educators willing to listen, we've learned that students are coming to class hungry, struggling to finish homework, navigate extracurricular activities, hold down jobs, and feed themselves. Eventually you start losing focus and your body starts shaking. Their grades suffer and many are forced to drop out at a much higher rate than their food secure peers. I was feeling like enough was enough and I couldn't take it with being homeless with two children. But that doesn't have to be the only way. Hi, thank you for calling Purple Apron Panchi. Colleges and Food Bank for New York City have teamed up to establish over 20 college campus pantries across the city to help stamp out hunger one student at a time. You can always come to school and find the resources you need. I now know that I can take, I cannot take them for granted because the, all of the great resources they provide for us is not everywhere else. When you bring fresh, nutritious food to campuses, you change lives, delivering the vital resources students need to survive and the hope they need to thrive. It's a blessing. It's it's like it's like thank you to God. Like like in um in our language we say Alhamdulillah, which is thanking God for whatever He's giving us. Let's empower our city's future leaders to achieve food security for good. There is no one better to invest in them than you. Welcome to the College Food Security Summit. So we're gonna bring on our keynote speaker. A um, few lines we're gonna read about them. When we thought about our keynote speaker, we wanted a person who not only talks the talk, but also walks the walk. We wanted an educator and knows, and knows what you are going through because he literally has been in your shoes. He's going to talk about his own personal experience with food insecurity and how his profession empowered high school students to ensure they had the critical resources they need to succeed. Well, that reminds us of us, uh, us here at McEvers College family in CUNY. He currently is a principal at Westside High School. Help me to welcome Principal Akbar Cook, a brother from another mother. We're doing the same work. <laughs> good, good. As the gentleman said, I'm Principal Akbar Cook. First, I want to give the Food Bank of New York. Thank you, Medgar Eggers College. Thank you as well for having me. Uh, principal, Newark, New Jersey, right across the water. Humble beginnings. My grandmother always was a caretaker to the less fortunate. Even though she had a lot of grandkids, she found a way to go adopt some more babies. So that's why I feel like it's in my DNA. My education background came from my auntie. We all have an auntie. My auntie was Carolyn Cook. Auntie got me to work at a camp called Life Camp. And at this camp, it's like I became the kid whisperer. Like I knew what the babies were saying. I could figure them out. So while I'm at this camp, I end up going to a junior college in Kentucky, rural Kentucky. I don't know if you guys have been to Kentucky, but I'm not talking about Louisville, Lexington. I was in between tobacco fields and it was two buildings. This is where I learned that food security was real. So we had two buildings, as I said, but we had to eat when the nuns or the sisters ate. So you literally had to get up in the morning at eight, you maybe got around lunchtime at 12, and then you guys had to eat like around five o'clock. So now as a division one athlete, that's kind of hard. So I'm just like, I'm missing, I'm missing meals and all of that and I'm starving. So I called my auntie. I said, auntie, I need some money. Auntie said, boy, don't you ever call me without asking how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, how everything is going. So from then on, I always called auntie a week before I needed some money so <laughs> I could get the stuff, right? I finished out in the junior college, you know, we, and I ended up going to Florida Atlantic uh, University, Final Four, this, they just did the Final Four just now. Uh, went down to Florida Atlantic, and now I'm on a bigger campus. I'm in Boca Raton, guys. It is beautiful. You thinking now I'm gonna have all these different restaurants? No, 
It was not the case. So same thing goes. And now you're on a larger campus. So when we think about our kids in college and them eating, it's, it's kind of hard if you're doing like, you know, 6 a.m.s and then you got the lunch and then you sleep and you got night classes. So I realized it was real right then and there. But and another thing that came to uh, came to fruition was a lot of us don't know about financial. Uh, I'm going to say finance, I said my financial security. I'm sorry. It, it's escaping me right now. But we don't have that financial literacy background. So when I got to the Division One college, they give you a meal plan. They say, here, cook, here go 2,500. You have to figure out how to eat with that for the entire semester. Now, I'm a baby right out the hood. I went right and took that money, went to the mall, got me some shoes. I got some more other stuff. So, so that, you not told to give me some money. So it took me a while to figure it out. I want to say by my junior, senior year, I started going to Costco and maybe putting some stuff under my bed in my room so my roommates wouldn't eat it. But I ended up graduating, guys, and I became a teacher. And while I was a teacher, some of the some of the things changed. Like you always know, you guys been in school. We always get to the baby stew food. Like, oh, I got my principal coming. Y'all yeah, be good. I'm gonna give you a pizza party. So you know how we did it, right? And you guys would do all your good. I mean, good stuff like that. But until I became a vice principal is when I realized the needs were stronger. I became a vice principal in, at North Vocational, and we, after four or five years, it was going smooth. And then, just like some districts do, they said, "Cook, we're gonna close your school." And I'm like, why? We got the best enrollment. I got all the good stuff going on for the kids. They say, well, there's a school up the street called Westside High School. And it's the worst school in the state of New Jersey. It's riddled with gangs. It's violence. They just slapped the principal. So we think you guys would be a good fit up there. And at the time, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So we end up going to this school. And I want to say the first week, guys, uh, one of my baby girls was missing. First time ever, I, I told you, I'm coming from, you know, middle school babies all the way up to high school and the baby was missing. I want to say around two weeks, they found her body in an abandoned building. My first bout with death. So I'm trying to figure out these kids, they don't know us, but I know if you love on them and you be consistent and you fair, you'll figure it out, but that sent shockwaves through the school. So trying to push kids in rooms and stuff, cook, you trying to get us in the room, the teachers ain't teaching. So we got to listen to all of that. And we started to write the ship because they saw we wasn't letting up. And I want to say about midway through that year, they kidnapped one of my 15-year-old boys. I know this stuff is sounding like a movie. It was like a movie that I was living to me. And at that, that 15-year-old boy, he was supposedly the plug for all of the good drugs in the area. When he didn't give up his plug, his connect, they killed this young man and threw his body in the neighborhood. That was two babies, y'all, my first year at the school. The summer came up, and I felt so helpless. I felt like everything in my area was either my kids were doing it or was happening to my kids. One of the most helpless times I ever felt. I vowed that I would never feel that way again. So we get back to school, better teachers, the kids know us. We ride the ship and everything is going smooth. All right, we get down to business. I had one kid, guys, and I tell this story all the time about, they say the gangsters don't come to school. They don't look their mother, daddy, grandma, auntie in the face and say, I ain't going, nothing you can do about it. They just go to the streets. But I had this one baby, ankle bracelet on every day, cops coming. I want to say every two or three days. And it's like, you know, a big show every time they come. I went up to him. I'm like, bro, like, like what's going on? He said, cook, man, my mama going to see me walk across that stage. She deserved it. I put her through too much. I felt him. They killed that baby two weeks before graduation and drive by shoot. It's three. So now the summer's here and I'm like, I can't sit back and watch this again. I have to do something. So I'm a Boys and Girls Club kid. I said, you know what? I'm going to open up my building. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I was going to create a type of camp. I said, I'm going to open up my building Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And I'm just going to love on them. I'm going to feed them, and I'm just going to give them some recreation and let them be kids. I had no idea what it was going to look like. First night, I want to say we had 40 people come out, right? 40 people. And it was a weird mix of people. It was like uh, I had like um, parents. I had like 25-year-old gangbangers and eight-year-olds. The weirdest mix you ever see, like, did you stay, right? But they were there. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to feed them. We're going to do all that stuff. And at the time, the food I was given wasn't the best meals. If you guys remember free lunch, we got them little packs. You rip it open. It's a string of cheese and maybe celery and a chicken salad sandwich. Wasn't the best meals. But definitely on chicken salad night, I had to go down to, I would take the meals that weren't eating, and I'd take it down to the uh, Penn Station, and I would feed the homeless, right? So doing this the first night, it was 40, then I get 50. And then a gentleman, he did a uh, article. He said, oh, you should guys see what this young man is doing in the city of Newark to combat all the stuff that's going on in the city. 
when that article went out, we started getting more kids and more kids and just more adults. And it was a beautiful thing. That whole summer, I want to say we was averaging about 120 some people and the summer ended and I was like, yes, nothing happened. I was so excited. And it was like right around Labor Day. I'm like, you know what? I got to throw a party and I'm going to have all the food trucks, all this stuff. So I did it. And we had like 278 people came out. I want to say ice cream trucks, DJs. I was giving out anything that wasn't stolen. Here's a Keurig machine for you. Here's a vacuum cleaner for you. Loving it. One of my baby girls, freshman, she came up to me, gave me a high five. She got some ice cream and she left. Later on that night, she was killed by a straight bullet. Four babies. It kind of drove home the point, two things for me. One, you can't wait until the summer to save them because this was after the summer, right? You got to do something and more, I need to do something for the girls. So after that, we started doing all these amazing things that you'll, you'll hear about if you read the bio and things of that nature. But ever since then, 2016, 2017, we haven't lost any more kids to gun violence at all. So now the baby's safe, right? That's because I said some stuff got to take a back seat. We're talking about food security, but if your babies are not safe, you got to figure something out, right? So now came the next thing. The kids said, cook, we're not eating. I'm like, okay. And this is my first time hearing the word parentified. Like a lot of my babies are taking care of their younger siblings. Their parents are either not there or they work in so many odd jobs, they leave it up to them to do that. So by the time they take their kids to school, and they get to us, so many ladies they done miss breakfast. I said, that's easy, I got that. I don't care if it's a Pop-Tart at the door waiting on you, you're gonna eat something. I'm gonna make sure you're good, right? Did that. My school is 100% free and reduced lunch, so that means they eat lunch, right? But I want you guys to think about lunch. Like, we all go to restaurants and we go out to different places and there's always some salt and pepper at the table. It might be some hot sauce. Why little kids just gotta get whatever that cafeteria person slop on a tray and they gotta eat it? So I'm like, you know what, I can fix that. My baby's not eating, I get some hot sauce or some adobo, soy sauce, you know. I'm gonna do all of that for the babies. Just make sure they're good. So now they're eating, cool. But I said, cook, we don't eat on weekends. All right, okay. So I, I, I got with my community food bank in New Jersey and I said, listen, do y'all got something for me? They said, well, Cook, we have a family pack uh, program where the parents sign up and it'd be enough food for a family of four. I'm like, cool, I got all my parents to sign up and do all of this great stuff. And then came that first day, I called the babies downstairs. Kids came downstairs, again, gave them what's packed. As soon as they get outside, oh, you the kid with the free food, oh. And I'm like, your mother called me too. Why are you making fun of him? Like, you need it as well. <laughs> Right? So I'm like, I don't know why you're doing that, but it's, it's, it's a cultural thing where we try to make fun of things of that nature. So I'm like, okay. So I changed the name. The attendance all-stars come downstairs. Ah, oh, you still that kid that need the food. So then I used some of the uh, backpacks that we can give out for the backpack giveaway, trying to hide it. I went to the mall, Aeropostale, you know, Gap Bags, trying to hide it. Again, it was just a Band-Aid. We wasn't getting to the root of, the, you know, the, the problem, which is we got to change the mindset of these kids. So... I was like, what can I do, what can I do? Well, I, as you can see, I like to eat. I'm a food and network guy, right? I'm a food network. So I was like, you know what? They got a show called Chopped. I'm gonna get me a YouTube channel. I'm gonna do West Side Chopped. I'm gonna show the babies what to do with these amazing ingredients. If you don't watch Chopped, they take a mystery ingredients and they gotta cook a meal, right? So, cool. The first episode, I, I had to cancel it after two. I didn't have the funding, but you get it, what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so, but after the first, well, on the first episode, I'm going to give you guys the mystery ingredients. I know some of you guys are like, you can cook. They had, in the family pack, they had tuna fish, they had ragu, mixed vegetables, and Cheerios. And not even the Honey Nut Cheerios, regular plain Cheerios. So I'm like, I don't know what they're going to do with this basket, so we're going to see. One person crunched up the, uh, the Cheerios, made into breadcrumbs, and by the age, put some eggs with the tuna fish, made them little crab tuna fish cake, bam, Threw some ragu on top, mixed vegetables, bam. I say, look at God, right? Oh, <laughs> what? My babies took to it like it was no other. So they like, oh, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with my basket now. So now we took something that was, you know, the food insecurity and something pride related, and we changed it to something positive. So now not only do my kids get, I want to say, uh, we call it acts of kindness. They get certificates and stuff, but they also taking care of our neighbors with our homes. They taking care of other families. So now we made it a thing. So that was another thing, right, that was solved, right? Cool. I think I'm cool with the food. Then it becomes, but cook, your kids are not coming to school. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They said 85% of your children are staying home four to five days a month. You guys know when we grew up, 
you missed 19 days. You stayed back. That was it. It's not the case now. So I'm like starting to get into the root of it and, you know, come to find out they were talking about the uniforms. Now, I'm not a big uniform guy. I kind of flip flop from time to time. But when you think about uniforms, guys, they uh, give the kids their khakis. Khakis get dirty just looking at them. Right on the hanger. The khaki's dirty right now. You didn't even put it on. And I'm going to put this on a five-year-old, let him ride around on the floor. Like, it just doesn't make sense. So I was like, you know what? I got something. I'm going to change the colors, right? I'm going to change the colors. I put on black khakis, you know, heather gray, change the different color of the shirts. Still wasn't getting the numbers that I expect. I'm like, but what's going on? They're like, cook, we can't clean our clothes. I'm like, all right, okay, I got something for that. So at the time I was meeting with my alumni, my alumni have some, some great people on the board with them. And one of them was our local uh, uh, energy company. You guys have Con Edison, we have PSE&G. So PSE&G was there. I said, okay, hey guys, listen, I wanna get some washers and dryers and I'm just gonna put it in my school. Can you guys help me out? They said, Cook, write us a grant and we will give you some money. Cool, right? I wrote the worst grant in history. It said, I need washed and dryers, period. That was it. <laughs> Sin. They gave me $20,000, guys. Yeah, baby. Right? I get the $20,000. I come back to my district like, oh, we about to cash out. Send me to Lowe's, Home Depot. I'm about to get all of the best of the best. They're like, okay, Cook, we're going to send over our, our, you know, our architects and all that other stuff. This should come back and say, Cook, it's going to cost you $300,000 to put this laundry room in your school. Come on, I know the price in New York is crazy, guys, but $300,000, I'll give you something nice right here in Brooklyn, right? I said, okay, but now it's getting bad, guys, because now my babies are being uh, bullied. They are fighting because of the bullying and things of that nature. So I'm like, guys, listen, we got to figure this out. So my district said, Cook, you know it's all about venting out. If you can find a place that vents out so we can send the dryer out, we got you. So, you know, just like... In this college and other schools across the nation, we usually it's one, one wash and dry it. Either for the linens, for the football team, mom was for the football team, right? Immediately kicked them out the locker room, gone. It was 2017. I haven't won a football game since, I think, too. So, But I kicked my football guys out, right? Kicked them out. Bam, I think we got it. So I got them out. They got the, it was, it was, it was uh, venting out. So now uh, they came and they put the wash and dryers in. Then it became, but who's uh, paying for the water bill? Who paying for the electricity? So now I just become the principal. I was a vice principal all of that time, guys. And I just become the principal. And I'm like, what are we going to do? Right? Because now they hooked up, but no one's going to, we can't use them. So I was doing a tour of my Lights On program. Other, other principals come by and they want to see what we're doing so they can emulate what we're doing. So someone took a picture of me in front of the washing dry. I said, oh my God. And they said those magical words. Principal combats bullying, attendance, and all these good things for the babies. Right? Went viral. Every news channel called me, I want to say every channel, two, three, I was on Telemundo, everything, <laughs> everything, called, right? I called my superintendent. I said, guess what, man? On Monday, I'm going to be on TV, right? You're going to be on TV as well because you ain't hook up these washes and dryers. What you say? <laughs> they was hooked up in an hour, right? <laughs> Done. Right? So, again, I'm on TV that morning. And all day. And I'm going to do like you. I'm going to film myself. I'm going to put it on Facebook. And at the time, it wasn't reels yet. It was still 59 seconds on Instagram. And I was like, you know, cook, should I put it on there? It's only 59 seconds. I said, well, they'll get the gist of it. Luckily, I did that because that clip I put on Instagram made its way all the way to Burbank, California. And that's when I got the call from my friend Ellen. Right. So Ellen DeGeneres called. And guys, listen, I thought that this would be an amazing thing. Right. I thought that we would. Uh. Me and some other educators, right, we would be on a cover of Time saying, look what these people are doing to fight, you know, attendance, food insecurity, all that good stuff. Not the Ellen show, right? I, but they called. So when I get there, y'all got to tell me my time. I'm just talking. I don't know where I'm at right now, but all right, because I ain't got that much. But um, so I get to Burbank, and it's, Ellen's like the, the Wizard of Oz. You don't see her at all. She's just like somewhere over there, right? So I'm there. And the producers take me in the back and they say, all right, let's go over some questions. I'm like, cool. First question, I mess up. All right, I'll get it. Let's go. Second question, I mess up. They're like, yo, what you doing, man? I said, I'm nervous, man. He says 50 million people watching, man. You, you can't be messing up. I'm like, if you was coaching me, you're doing a bad job because I'm even more nervous <laughs> now. Right? So we go through that. 
One of the questions was, is it cooked? Please don't mention the babies passing away. It was like, you know, Ellen crowd, they may not be able to take it. I said, cool, got it. Asked me another question, cool. And it's like, but now, lastly, like, sometimes Ellen's like the freestyle. So just be prepared, cool, all right. Now I'm ready, guys, right? Now they take me out of the room, you hear them now. <sighs> hear the crowd, I'm like, oh my God, right? So now I go backstage, and if you read my, my, my story or you, you read up on me, I've been on Ellen three times, right? And it's a beautiful thing, right? Three times. But it seems like every time I go, they have this like hunk ahead of me. I don't know why, right? First time was Colin Jost, like you know, SNL, right? Then it was Mark Wahlberg, like, okay, Marky Mark, right? You know, great guy. And then they had John Mayer, this six, four, beautiful, blonde, blue eyed. I'm like, why are they like getting me to like, I don't know, like, are you trying to send me subliminal messages or what? But okay, cool. Back to my segment. So now, I'm there, and they like, okay, we, all right, you ready? And, I, and, I, and I'm nervous, guys, there's four chairs here. They was like, you wouldn't believe who sat in these four chairs. And I'm like, I don't care, I'm about to fall on these four chairs, right? <laughs> so it's my segment, I, I mean, they, 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 I'm, back, I'm right there, back there. Colin Joseph, one of them pretty dudes just walked by, and then they played my segment, and, and, and on the segment, I talked to my kids about family, right? And we used the acronym, it says, forget about me, I love you, right? And what that means is, Give you a, just a quick uh, uh, a definition. I'm a coach, right? I coach high school basketball. At the end of the day, I'm supposed to just game 10 o'clock at night. I'm just supposed to just let the babies just go home while I drive away in my car. they on the corner. You know, like, no, forget about me and all that other stuff. I'm going to make sure that you get home. That's what it meant. So that baby said it. I'm like, oh, my God, they listening, right? So now I got this, like, teary eye. And they said, and now introduce the principal Akbar Cook. And I just knew, guys, I was going to have the smoothest walk on the planet. I thought it was going to be like Billy D or Denzel Washington. I thought I was going to just come out so smooth. Man, I had jelly legs. I probably had the fastest time to Ellen in the history of the show. I got to Ellen. We sat down, right? We started talking. The first question, nothing to do with anything we talked about. I'm like, okay, cool. Then she said, but then you lose four kids? And I'm like, am I being punked? Y'all yeah, just tell me backstage that I wasn't supposed to do this. And it was like, but... The story went on, and her best friend took me backstage after the segment. He was like, Cook, man, that energy between you guys. I don't know if you guys know, when people be doing shows, they be sitting there, they talking. He said, the whole time, you was just looking at Ellen. She felt that energy, and she kept you longer. And at the end of it, guys, she gave me $50,000, right, for the school, right? <laughs> but what I was so happy about and emotional was because you always see the stars, the basketball players, football players getting recognized. And they was recognize the work that some of us educators do every day. All I was doing what I'm supposed to do, right? Loving on these kids and removing barriers. So when they gave me that 50 dollars check, I'm glad they cut the commercial break because I was starting to cry and I was going to have that Michael Jordan meme and my kids were going to have me all over social media, right? <laughs> we get back home. We get back home. When I say it was, it was islands and Malta is in the Mediterranean Sea, it was people from all over the country sending us all type of uh, donations, right? It was, uh, I'm talking about laundry detergent out the wazoo. It was everywhere, right? So Procter & Gamble, you got to know make everything. Procter & Gamble, P&G makes everything. P&G got wind of the story. They sent me a thousand everything. Here comes, here comes uh, Arm & Hammer OxyClean. What? They sent you a thousand everything. They go two thousand of everything. <laughs> Bam. Uh-uh. Here come Colgate and Palmolive. They sent you two thousand. We're going to send you three thousand of everything. I said, hold up, guys. Can we switch it now? Let's talk about some feminine products for my girls. Let's talk about some toiletries, right? Some toothpaste, some deodorant, soap. So now since this happened, I wanted to bring, tell you the story. Since this happened, I was able to get so many different pantries in me. I have my own food pantry now for the babies. They can, they can go anytime they want to, right? I have a toiletry pantry, so kids never have to go without weather. Can you think about how prideful you feel like you're smelling or you have all these things going on? So they got toiletry pantry with all these feminine products. And my, girl, and my girls pick them out. And now I cook, choose this one. I'm like, girl, it was a lady you could have did this with. But you know, they still got me do it. Toiletry pantry. And now our last thing, we have a baby pantry. So for my babies that have babies, but also for families that are in my neighborhood that need to come and get some pampers and things of that nature. So we've been doing that, right? Yes. Leads me to my work now. So what I've been doing through the grace of God, just been going around and mentoring principals. And I say, you got to love on. We, if we get back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you got to make sure these babies are fed, right? That's first and foremost. So I make sure any school that I'm working with, I'm in 20 schools in New York City, I think two in L.A. and two in Vegas, but 
The point is, the first thing they have to do is they have to put a food pantry in there. You can't tell me you care about kids, you don't have a food pantry. And generally, that food pantry is for the families and sometimes the staff. My staff gets some of my food. You think teachers are doing good, they're struggling as well. So I make sure they have a food pantry, but I also try to say at least once or two times a year, you do a community giveaway. What I mean by community giveaway, you set up outside and anybody walking by can get some of the items that you have. And I want to thank the Food Bank of New York. One of my schools uh, that I work with, uh, Dr. Otto, is in East New York, Brooklyn, and Vista. You guys go out there every, I want to say, first or second Tuesday of the month, and you guys help them do their community. So I thank you for that. But that's, that's what I'm doing now, guys. And I always want you, don't, don't forget about those high school kids, right, or the college babies. They think that once you sent them on, they're good. They're not. They're struggling behind doors. The depression is real, especially after COVID. We always got to love them and make sure they're good. Leave you with one thing. My uh, grandma always told me this African proverb. It says, a candle doesn't lose its flame by lighting other candles. Keep lighting the candles. Thank you, guys. As a principal at Westside High School, what is the level of food in insecurity um, that your students face? So not only are my kids prideful and don't want to be the one that's taking, so we had to break down that, that, that uh, fixed mindset. Um, also, we don't have access to the fresh produce and things of that nature, right? We in a food desert, they call it. So I didn't get to speak about it earlier, but the money I got from Ellen, we did our own urban farm. Like I have my own chickens, I got my own bees, the honey, we got our own hot sauce that we sell. So I am trying to show them one, I'm sorry, how to monetize what ails them. So if it's fresh produce, let's go to farmer's markets and let's take what we got here and we do it. So that's how I've been trying to break down the barriers, but also showing them that it is cool to be, you know, giving back to the community as well. What realities must some face when speaking about food insecurities, especially like with the younger? We have to, it's a cultural thing. Like we grew up hiking or doing the dozens of things of that nature. It's not cool. And bullying is, is real right now. And mental health is real. So you have to show them why, but you gotta show them the end of the, end of the rainbow too. Like, cause I'm still not gonna wanna take this package home. But if you tell everybody that I'm helping somebody else out, maybe I can start building that, you know, that, that pride and that trust that I don't feel like you'll be making make, making uh, uh, fun of me. But also, it takes our our, our new folks coming in. My, my, my first generation kids, they don't care about none of that. They come and give me that. What? They're they, they taking everything. So they're leading the pack. They're the trailblazers. So shout out to all my first generation, all my kids coming over to the city. How can we make students in the community feel more comfortable with asking for help? That's a, that's a, heavy, that's a heavy lift. I just think you just got to show them that you would you would do anything for them. I, I tell teachers, the best teachers have the best relationship with kids. And it starts with you being vulnerable. You got to talk about, like I want to be, I talked about some of the things that was going on with me that, you know, people may not be able to see. You got to be vulnerable. And only then they will be vulnerable with you and they can start asking. So that's just like with anything. So I tell teachers, the best teachers have the best relationship with kids. If you open up to them, they open up to you. So that's what I would say. What do you expect for people to take away from this summit today? And there was a lot of um, younger college students in the audience. So what do you expect for them to take away? I'm hoping that they saw a little bit of me and them and uh, hope they would be vulnerable and, and closed mouths don't get fed. So I would hope that they start speaking up for themselves. I mean, we always want our kids to be advocates. So I'm hoping that they, they gain that today from me talking. It's gonna be advocates for themselves and they're gonna, like I said at the end, I said, uh, candle doesn't lose flame by lighting other candles. And hopefully they'll light some other candles. Let's keep them candles lit, y'all. We know the makeup of our students, that they come from mostly immigrant, if not first generation themselves, college students, and people who are working multiple jobs to get their way through. And we started to hear from our students that they needed help. They needed more support. And they thought that a food pantry could do that. Hi, thank you for calling Purple Apron Pantry. It was like a relief. It's like knowing that there's food that we can use and like going out to buy the same food item is gonna cost like, so much money. Students were like, I have $200 to make it through the week. Yeah. But they have to pay for a Metro card, they have to pay their credit card bill, their phone bill. It was overwhelming. It was an overwhelming feeling, not knowing what you're gonna eat next, not knowing if you can eat, like going to sleep hungry. It's just weight, it's just stress. If you want your students to succeed, they cannot be taking you know, classes that are super complicated and then having to leave class and think, can I buy a bag of chips and will that tie me over until nine o'clock and then I'll just go to sleep hungry. That is unacceptable. Having the food bank when I needed it, it feels like I feel grateful. 
to the people who are donating i just want to say thank you for donating i worked to get my bachelor's i got my bachelor's and now I'm ready to, for the next stop, which is to get like a full-time job. These students are here because they want it, because they need it, because they're trying to make a generational difference in their families. And you're helping them by providing them this food. And then this is what is gonna make the next generation stronger. And um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to present this distinguished panel of managers and students um, to share with you their experiences and their perspectives on food uh, security. So we're going to jump right into it. And I'm actually going to start with the students so that we can hear their perspective and their experiences. And so to Taylor and to Kamaya, say that right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for being with us today and willing to share. I know Taylor is missing some of her clinical work. So can we just give them a round of applause for this one? being here with us and being willing to share their experiences. So can you tell us, um, please share your ways um, that the institution um, helped you to overcome challenges with food security? What has the institution done that you attend? Taylor, you can start. Um, hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, I'm a single mom. Um, and I was facing, well, I thought some challenges. Sometimes you kind of, in the midst of the stress, forget what's in front of you. And I came to school as an intern and was like, oh, hold on. You got, you got food <laughs> here at the school. <laughs> There's no need to worry about anything. Honestly, as a student at McAvers, um, we have the opportunity to go shopping once a week, every week, as long as we're um, you know, registered for the semester. So... I just told myself that I was gonna shop at the school after I went from classes and I was gonna take whatever I had and I made it work. And honestly, it was a very rough time, but I learned to um, use my resources on campus and I shared the information with my other classmates and my other students because this was my first time facing food insecurity issues. Um, I'd had problems with my mom being a young girl, so I knew what it was to be embarrassed, um, to be ashamed, to ask for help. and <clears throat> I'm, I'm very emotional because it was a it was a time in my life when the word speaks for itself. You're transitioning, you know, through higher education, things are very tough. You're adjusting, um, and you don't know how real it's gonna get until it gets real. So, um, I'm so thankful to my favorite director, Dr. Wally Boone. Um, when I came to him just to tell him about my problems, he really kind of gave me every option I had and more. And I didn't need it. You know what I mean? Like it, it was available to me, but I told myself I was going to use the resources here and I was going to make it work. And I did. And I went shopping every week and I told my classmates and then my classmates was coming. And then I was bringing like 12 people with me and everybody was just coming and getting food because I was letting them know it was no reason to be embarrassed because the resources was ours to have. So come and use them. Absolutely. And so Kamai, can you add your uh, experience? I agree with Taylor. Like with Dr. Boone, I was had last March. I was having troubles at home, and I was I didn't tell anybody about it. I just was was thugging it out. So Dr. Boone, well, Miss Lisa, um, she's the director of the Women's Center here at Mecca. I spoke to her about it, and she recommended Dr. Boone, and I it took me months to go to him because I, I was very prideful about it and didn't want to speak. But once I went to him, he felt, he made me feel at home, felt like I wasn't a burden on anybody and, and really helped me with my support. Wonderful. And so um, what do you think you need to be successful and how has the pantry helped you in doing that? To be successful really is just the support. Mm -hmm. Like, not having not having support is you start to think bad thoughts like I'm gonna drop out um, I'm not good for this I, I need to get a job I don't have time for school so with that support it helps it really does help wonderful Taylor to add on to um what Kamaya was saying I could definitely say support is it it gets very tough when you're focusing or worrying about where you're gonna get food or where you're going to sleep so 
just to know that we didn't have to worry about that as students um, on campus, it was very helpful to us. Um, I, I didn't have to worry. I was focused on my assignments. I was getting them in in time. And overall, just to share the information about about the pantry, because a lot of students don't know sometimes, not saying that it's the information is not here, but a lot of times we are caught up in our own lives. So yeah. just sharing the information was my support also, you know what I mean, to my classmates. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, um, Taylor, um, how big of an issue do you think food insecurity is or food access to other students is? Oh, it's a big issue. Um, just as, um, I'm sorry, the gentleman, um, Nick Fer Fer Ferguson, if I'm saying it right, I'm, uh -huh. Ferguson, yeah, Ferg, um, that, that, yeah, when he was Ferg, saying uh -huh. about the, the numbers and how it increased over the pandemic, um, yeah. I definitely can say a lot of things happen behind doors, you know, and even though we are in a space where we do have conversations about it, people are still embarrassed. Um, right. so just knowing, um, that there are a lot of students out there that are not speaking about it as an issue overall, you know, because we don't know what the numbers can be, you know, and it could be more severe than what we're even expecting. So it's a it's an issue that um that needs to be dealt with. And Kamaya, have you experienced many of your fellow students who are experiencing food in, food insecurity, and have you informed them about uh, pantries? That I know of, no. But I just feel like they should know mm -hmm. just because even if they don't need it, the, the exposure needs to be there. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm going to ask each of you individually, what are you studying? And what are your career goals and your professional um, aspirations after you've left college? Um, so I'm a social work intern right now. I am at Hunter's um, Silverman School of Social Work in my graduate program. Um, my goals are to graduate yeah. <laughs> class 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to um, I hope to pass my my board exam. And um, my professional aspirations will be to open a nonprofit in my my neighborhood right now, which is Sheepshead Bay. Um, but also. Anywhere social services is at is really something I want to do for the rest of my life. Wonderful. Great career. Great career. And how about you? Well, I'm a sophomore here at Megger, and I major in public administration. And I want to, with that, made, well, with that degree, I want to become, I want to run for city council. Nice. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. And I also want to help troubled Black and Latino teens and communities to get the essentials that they need. That's a wonderful aspiration. Very, very good. You know, in the audience today and throughout this program, you've had some tremendous leaders and decision makers. Um, I wonder if you have an opportunity to say something to them. What is it that you'd want them to take away from this experience today? What would you want them to know concretely? That that these these pantries really help your students. Like I can't I can't stress it enough. I get so emotional thinking about it because I know what it's like to be hungry. And just to stop that hunger, yeah. <sighs> you have no idea. You know what I mean? Like the, the burdens that you take off our backs when you do those kind of things. And I just commend everybody who's continuing to make sure that the students at CUNY and all over New York City are continuing to get you know, the resources that we need to succeed through higher education because it is true that when we are worried about where we're going to sleep and where we're going to eat, we don't want to come to school. We are not focused on our assignments and we are, we are depressed. We are going through a whole bunch of things and it is very important to just know that you can come to a place to get a meal, which is essential. Absolutely, thank you. Yep. How about you? What I hope everyone leaves here with is just the exposure, like I said earlier. Just knowing about the program helps everybody and others. Thank you. Uh, and so we've come to the final session of um, with our students, and I'm wondering if you have any last-minute thoughts, any last-minute words that you'd like to 
give to your fellow peers, your students who might be in our audience, um, about the resources and about the ways that they may be able to get assistance on the campus? I just want to say, ask for help. That's the least that you can do. Mm -hmm. the, the worst anybody could say is no. So yeah. And to add on to that, um, as well as ask for help, to not be embarrassed. Um, sometimes it's important to be the first person to make the move. You'll be surprised that when you say something, 20 more people come behind you. You know what I mean? And tell you that they got a problem too. So I'm that kind of person, I'm, I'm into sharing. When I enter the room, I, I make it my room. You know, I want everybody to know that I'm on one accord and we're all together. So um, continue to make communities, you guys. You know, um, as students on campus, be open-minded to everybody is not going through the same thing that you're going through, but they could possibly can be, you know? So just share some things sometimes. And if you know any information, share it as well. That's right. Thank you so very much. Appreciate you being here. And so, you know, um, for Rhonda and for Rain, um, Rhonda being the manager, the director at the Guardia, um, community college, um, known for many years, um, doing an excellent job over there. And Rain um, is uh, also working at uh, Bronx Community College, doing a tremendous, tremendous job holding up the fort over there. And I could tell you, as a frontline manager, I've been at BMCC for 14 years doing this work, and um, I am acutely aware of the impact of having a pantry on the campus and what it does for our students. Um, I mean, in any given day, we're providing anywhere between 70 and 100 students with pantry bags. Uh, and you know, we're, we're there five days a week from eight to six. So I wonder if you can tell us um, why it's impactful to provide pantry, food pantry to students and their families, and how does the pantry affect the different aspects of a student's life? A great question. Um, it's important in how it impacts a student's life is because if you're hungry, you cannot focus. We all know that. And a student will come in hungry and want food to take home to their children. So I can offer you something on campus, but if my children ain't getting fed at home, then what am I really doing? So having the pantries with foods that they can take home and feed their family puts them at ease. And the impact is they stay in school. They don't have to stop working. Um, and that's it. Uh, for me, I think the food pantry is very important because it adds to the economy. The goal of higher education is to educate students and to that, with that education, empower them to be self-sufficient and take care of them and their families. And there's a gap when they cannot do that because they are food insecure. And so the food pantry is a much broader um, impact and influence because we're talking about being an aid, a tool, a resource, and assistance to help and to undergird higher education as they uh, educate students. So we are a very important part of that, of that dynamic and that journey for students. Yeah. And I think that you know all too well that many of our students are reluctant to come forward uh, to, um, although I have to be honest, at BMCC, I think I'm seeing a little less because of this economy and because folks cannot afford to go to the grocery store, I'm seeing a little less stigma, but it still exists. Can you just address the fear uh, or the stigma that students uh, experience and what strategies or tools you're using to um, ensure that students come to use the pantry? It's interesting that individuals um, have this notion that there is something that's gonna be required of you if you offer food for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we have the conversations with students and we tell them it's free, well, what do I have to do for it? Mm -hmm. You have to show up mm -hmm. and ask. That's it? Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. And so once you get past that barrier, um, then there is the stigma of, I don't want anyone to see me actually taking food from the pantry. And so I think that at LaGuardia, we've been really fortunate to strategically place the pantry where it's among classrooms, uh, the hours are convenient to the students, 
Uh, we have online ordering uh, for the students. We have these cute bags and we have students volunteering in the pantry that also are recipients of the pantry. So it's peer-to-peer -peer conversations. It's peer-to-peer -peer advocacy. It's peer-to-peer -peer outreach uh, because of course, if you study marketing, you know anything about marketing, uh, you purchase based on what looks like you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the pantry must reflect what looks like the students that we serve. Absolutely. And so that's a way to, you know, to help that myth about, oh, I can't use it. And then the various cultures and backgrounds and things like that. But the pantry has to look like the students in which we serve. Absolutely, Rain. I would just say I challenge students when they tell me, oh, I don't want a bag. I don't need a bag. I said, call your mother. <laughs> call the person in your house right now. Tell them I'm giving away eggs, chicken, fresh produce, and I want to hear them tell me you don't need it. And I had a few students that called their mother, and it was like, get that bag. So we are now <laughs> they bring their parents with them to the pantry. But one of the things that we did um, as a suggestion from actually Food Bank was we did the Healthy Cart Initiative, yeah. where we put um, in a building on the floor, some snacks that students can come and grab and go. So we have oatmeal, granola bars, um, um, non-heat meals, um, just things that juice boxes, milk, cereals, things that they can grab and go because when they're hungry, that's the first part. You're hungry now, not later, you're hungry now. So breaking that wall down to get them to come to that. And I'm like, oh, well, we have a pantry too. You could come on this day with your bags. And at pantry, what we try to do so they don't feel like they're waiting online outside um, is we give away smoothies. Sometimes we'll make smoothies right there for them and serve them. We'll do um, coffee and tea to make it inviting. The other thing that we did is we got the food and nutrition club involved from our campus where they created recipes uh, based on the products that we had were given out in the pantry. So one of the things, they make a delicious black bean burger. Oh, my God. So they would make the burger and then give out samples. Nice. And the students were like, oh, wait, I can make this. And they showed them how. So those are the ways we try to get around some of the stigma. Wonderful. And so beyond food, what are, mo what are some of the most important services that you also offer? I would say uh, legal services um, with housing insecurities, mm -hmm. which was spoken about earlier, mm -hmm. um, and financial literacy. Um, and SNAP, registra registering students for SNAP or some of the other services. Um, at BCC, we try to do a holistic approach um, so that we're not just battling one concern, we're battling all your concerns at once so that you can focus and, re and retain your education path. Yeah. And I know, you know, it's interesting because it, the same at uh, BMCC, and we heard it earlier, that it's not a one-off in terms of the needs of our students. It's many, many services that the students come to us needing. I mean, my, um, my resident manager is here. Some of you may know that we have housing, BMCC has housing uh, for 40 of our students uh, of housing who are housing insecure. So it's that, it's the emergency grants that thanks to Petrie, Food Bank for New York, all of these organizations that just are so supportive of the work that we do. Rhonda, what are the other things that you're doing? Well, you mentioned most of them. I mean, we're proud of our external partners that we have as well. So we have partnerships like Airbnb to help combat the housing um, initiative. We also work with NCS and uh, the emergency fund. Like our school is very supportive about providing LaGuardia Cares with an operational budget. And I will talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that helps us to focus on what is trending at this particular time. And I say that because since I've been at LaGuardia, and it's been a little over 10 years, the top three things are housing, food, and transportation. Mm -hmm. However, whatever is happening in the economy affects the students, and it happens with position and how that unmet need um, should be addressed. And so we provide all of those services um, as well, if you, as you mentioned. That's so great. And as I'd asked um, the students a moment ago, we have decision makers in our audience, and I just wonder if I can get from you your um, perspective on what you would want them to take away today uh, from this discussion and from the entire experience, actually, because it's been so great. Where's Wally? It's been excellent, um, you know, so far. So what would you want them to take away from, from what we're discussing today? 
Well, one, those that already are funding, we told, we appreciate it so much. Our students, on behalf of all of the students of mm -hmm. CUNY, we thank you. Um, at BCC, we've seen almost 100% rise in the amount of students that come to our food pantry, but the dollars are still the same. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to stretch dollars um, for double the amount of people. So what I want you to take away is that uh, New York City, for success in New York City, you need to invest in CUNY. CUNY takes up the student population is how much of New York we said earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Leslie Gordon said, people are promises. And it's a promise for our future. So if you have a way or know a way to invest in BCC, Mega Evers, LaGuardia, all the CUNYs, that's what I would ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rhonda? For me, I would say I hope that you've taken down the names of individuals that be, should be at the table when you're making decisions. Because many times we have individuals that are at the table, but they're not on the ground doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so that is very important because those that are on the ground doing the work can give a different perspective. They can be a voice for the students and the populations in which we serve. And so I would really hope that um, the individuals that are here are taking names and listening intentively to understand and to know who should be at the table. Yeah, and you know, that's such a great segue to this next question I'm gonna ask you, particularly Rhonda, um, because you know, we, we've been in the trenches for a while, and so we are very, very, uh, we're acutely aware of what our students uh, need, and faculty and staff, by the way, it's not only students that, that come to the pantry. Um, and so one of the things that we've talked about is related to sustainability of the food pantries. Now, while we love, we adore our, our funders, um, again, some of, some of the most uh, um, committed ones, uh, Petri and, and Food Bank for New York and HRA and the many, many, many um, funders that we have, um, in many instances, our own institutions have not really um, developed a sustainability plan, even for those of us who advocate for it. And I know that you have been, and I'm so proud of you, Rhonda. I am so proud of you. You have been so tremendous in getting your institution to institutionalize your pantry. Can you share with us, uh, whether it was struggles or whether it was fights or whether it was just you, you doing whatever you do, how you were able to do that? So first, thank you. And to all of the directors of all the colleges and my colleagues who work have been in the trenches for forever. Your dedication and your commitment is commendable and everyone has a heart for the people that they serve. We are very fortunate that we do have an operational budget at LaGuardia. And in order to um, have that conversation, data is important. If you are not collecting data within your pantries or organizations, data is volume. Mm -hmm. And you have to know how to use that data to speak to the data as well as the narrative. So that, you know, I, there are two different types of people, narrative people and analytical people. And you have to know what to speak to them, each individual about and how to do that. Uh, with LaGuardia, it was very easy because the president and the VP from the time that I've been there understand and they know and they have not forgotten to where they have come from and the struggles that they faced. Yeah. And so it made it easy to have them on board to help other students because that's who they are and it's what they do. Um, to give you a little bit of context that I don't think people are aware of is that in order to stock the food pantry, it cost per month about five to twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That's to stock the pantry. That does not include uh, the equipment, the maintenance, the staffing, uh, and all of the things that it, that goes into operating a food pantry on campus. Right. And most of us receive consistent grant money of about $25,000. So you understand that reach. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, it takes, once we have received an award notification that we are receiving the funds, it takes about three to four months before we actually get those funds. 
So there's a gap and we're struggling to, how are we going to uh, stock the pantry and continue in service until we actually receive the money that we received in the email about that we've been awarded the money. So the operational um, funding, that budget line from the college, the institutionalization of that is very important because it helps us fill that gap until we're able to receive other funding in order to sustain the pantries. Mm -hmm. Also, the funds should be unrestricted because we talk about providing um, vending machines, but when you have unrestricted funds, you have the opportunity to do home deliveries, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to do grocery cards, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to uh, give debit cards where students could use the vending machine. So the funds should be unrestricted as well because seasons change. And so does the um, barriers that students face, depending upon what's happening in the economy. Um, so use the data, talk about how the data impacts GPA, mm -hmm. retention from semester to semester, and ultimately graduate. At LaGuardia Community College, the students that use the services uh, retain, have higher GPAs, and graduate higher than their counterparts that do not. We constantly speak that language. We constantly in educate and inform um, individuals that have, the, that have the privilege of going to the tables. They take that data with them, so that's important. Um, and so that would be the thing that I would say most is the data that drives it. Having a supportive team that understands sharing your story um, and being transparent, also cross-training faculty and staff so that they can be advocates as well within the classroom. Mm -hmm. So there is a, blur a blurb uh, in the syllabus about LaGuardia Cares, so the students know about that. We've cross-trained faculty and staff to look for indicators uh, so that they can refer students to LaGuardia Cares. And with all of that, that's all data. Mm -hmm. Surveys, feedback, cross-training, all, all of that's data. And it's packaged into a way that we can articulate and speak to all of the various areas, the wellness center, you know, mm -hmm. um, all of those areas and how we know at the end of the day, higher education is about business, right? So then you have to speak to, if a student receives the food pantry, they're retained from semester to semester and ultimately graduate, how does that add back into the economy? But look what it's doing for the financial stance of the college as well. So those would be some of the areas and some of the things that we've done. But they make my job easy because, like I said, I, I have great support. Yeah. I have great support. And that's so important. Listen, um, two seconds. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? You matter. You matter, and you can make a difference. That's right. When you go to the store and you pick up a couple of cans and donate to the pantry, that's making a difference. When you donate in your expertise, because we need your expertise, that makes a difference. Absolutely. And when you donate your finances, that makes a difference. So you matter and you can make a difference. Brain? Uh -huh. I just want to add, <laughs> just, just donate your time. Uh -huh. Your time to the pantry also does matter too. It also shows our students that we care and that we are there for them. And that's part of breaking down that stigma and breaking down that wall and getting them to feel comfortable. So, Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, can you give them? Thank you for your time.